Next sessions. Uh, yeah, if everyone can take place. Uh, our next speaker, Eduardo Fleury. Uh, please give him a hand. He will talk about styles and Qt. Okay. Well, hi guys, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eduardo. And first of all, I must say that being a Brazilian, I kind of feel uh, uncomfortable with so many people wearing orange t-shirts here. <laughs> Maybe could we use yellow next year. <laughs> but anyways. Let's, let's go back to work. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit, share a little bit our ideas about styles in Qt and KDE, and I hope that's why you are here today for. Uh, a little bit of background about myself and why is that presentation for. Um, I work for Open Balsa in Brazil, that's an auto research institute, and we've been working with uh, Qt guys for quite some time. And the presentation today, it's about a work that we've been doing in the, the last month, about uh, the last semester, I'd say, about uh, styling and research about that. And so I, I'd like to share the ideas with you today. The background of this research study is because Q4 has been on the road for quite some time. If I recall correctly, it was released back in 2005. Um, and since then, the context in which Qt uh, is being used has changed a, lo a lot. Now we have all these Nokia mobile devices using Qt and the expectation that it's gonna be used for a huge UIs and all that. So, of course, the requirements that Qt need to fulfill are different and the technology it needs to provide are different as well. Among the, the concepts that there are in Qt is the Q widget family of components. And while these components suit very well, very well some kinds of interfaces, it might not be as good uh, for fluid interfaces and mobile interfaces are, are as those we are seeking to, uh, looking to power to, to create. So, we have been wondering ourselves whether it would make sense to port the existing widgets to new technologies like the Qt Canvas, which currently is QGraphs View, or even to Qt Quick, Quick, which is the new declarative framework for describing interfaces. And also, when asking ourselves about whether we should port these widgets, we also asked ourselves whether we should rewrite or rethink the way the style styling works in Qt. So as we had more questions than answers, we decided to get together with Qt guys in Oslo and think about that. And so, and then we, we came, with, came up with the solution I'm gonna show you today here. The agenda today is to give a brief overview about what are styles and raise two uh, points where we think it could be improved the current implementation we have today, and then focus our time here and on explaining a new approach we propose here, and show how would be the interaction of this new styling approach with Qt Quick, and find a conclusion. So, about, style, about styles, what are styles about, what are styles? The, the whole idea is simple, the, the, the high level idea is simple here. The idea is to separate or split the painting logic of widgets from the uh, logic itself, the painting of widgets from the widget logic itself. Uh, just say uh, something. If you have any questions, I usually would rather you simply raise your hands uh, and I'll try to answer them throughout the presentation. So we just don't lose the, the understanding of it. So the idea is to split the painting of widgets from the logic of it. Um, this allows for both better code organization and also adds the flexibility to change the way a widget looks like and by consequence an application looks like without changing its code. 
That's how we can do, for instance, several KDE styles. We can change from one version to another and the applications, they are deployed applications and they simply look, change the way they look like without changing the way they behave and without requiring change in the, the application code itself. So how are styles implemented in Qt today and also in KDE? Um, Qt provides a class called QStyle and the interaction between the widgets that use that, that, um, that that's the style system and the QStyle class itself is then as shown in this small diagram. So we have several widgets in Qt, for instance, a button, like Q push button or K push, K push button, you can slider, whatever. As any Q widget, you have the paint method. That's where the widget is supposed to, to call Q painter methods to change, to, to draw uh, the real state they have to define the way it looks like. In Q widget system, the, in the paint method, it calls several methods from the Q, the Q and Q style that can be a KD style or GNOME style or Windows style Mac um, to delegate the task of painting to the Q and style. So widget says, for instance, draw primitive. Primitive can be background or text or any, uh, a highlight, paint or something like that. So the widget says, draw my background, I'm a button. The style then knows how to draw the background of a button and work uh, and behave properly. That means the button itself does not know if it's gonna look gray or blue or has a texture. That's up for the style to decide. And the same works for the text the, and etc. But for the style to know how to paint the button, no, it needs to know whether the button is currently pressed or checked. So uh, it will decide whether it's gonna paint the, the background raised or sunken or etc. Um, it also needs to know which the current label of the button um, or which the current icon etc. So it makes sense for the style to have some information about the current state of the button or whenever, whatever, uh, whatever widget is gonna paint at that time. This is done through a style option um, structure. It's simply a structure that's filled by the button with the current status, and that's parsed by the style in order to, to paint the primitive accordion. That's how it works today. So it works nicely, but we understand that a couple of things can be changed there or can be improved. The first of all is procedural painting. As I said before, in the paint method, the widget call several methods from the style in order to paint its background, its text, or its highlight, or whatever. And so the paint method itself is quite procedural, have several method calls, and it's monolithic in some sense. It, it does everything there. This can be a problem because the, uh, the painting method can, became, can become um, time consuming, especially if you have text rendering or SVG image rendering or other um, heavy, heavy tasks. When you have uh, high frame rate animations, uh, well, as, it, as it is the case in fluid UIs, that, may become, that can become a, a bottleneck and prevent the, the application from achieving the frame rate we expect. The other problem is the ability or flexibility the current system provides, it's not as good as we would expect. When I said that the button asks the style to paint its background and its text, for instance, it means that the button uh, is saying to the style it has to have a background, a background and it has to have a text. Um, on the other hand, while the style can change the way this background and text looks, the style cannot decide to add something more because this, the, the button will never ask for, for the style to draw, for instance, a, a, some kind of bling or some kind of other uh, mouse over hint or whatever. And more important than that, 
the style cannot change the way the widget behaves. For instance, let's say that in a given platform, we want the lists to, to respond to multi-touch gesture, multi gestures or to become uh, kinetic lists or maybe to increase the size of their mouse areas um, for the, the, mouse, the, the touch sensitive areas to be uh, larger than the area of the widgets themselves in order to better respond to finger clicks or something like that. That's not, not, that's not something that on the hands of the styles nowadays. So the styles can customize the look, but they're not, they cannot customize the way it feels to use such widgets. And that's something we like to address. So now I'm going to talk to you a little about the, the new approach we've, uh, we've been thinking about. We, have, we had three main requirements when I think about it. The first of all, uh, as I was just talking to Alan, was to, make, to think about something that was agnostic in terms of um, Canvas implementation. We do not, we do not want to think to, uh, about something that was meant to be used with graphics view or quick or uh, name it. We want to, to think of a concept abstract enough to be implemented in whichever canvas is going to be used in your application. Be that a current canvas or one that yet to exist. And also, of course, we, we had to address the problem of procedural painting and uh, give the flexibility regarding um, look and feel. So the solution we thought of is based on five concepts. If we are, you are able to understand these five concepts, we, you will, of course, understand the, the solution we thought of. I'm going to go through each of them. I do not intend to go in deep detail because both, I don't think we will have time enough for that. And because uh, I pu published um, a paper together with this presentation, so it will be available um, in the Academy uh, website probably. So if you wanna go into details, you can also refer to the written explanation it's easy to read. Um, and, and today we can focus on the high, the high level ideas and the concepts themselves. So the first thing to address uh, the idea of procedural painting, the other option we usually, usually think of is to use a primitive graph instead of a procedural painting. What's that? Well, also think to, to a diagram here to explain better. If we think about uh, above here, you can see the previous approach we were using. We had, for instance, a button, a start button. It has a background where you can see that gradient, uh, a small icon, and a text on it, a, la a label. So that button, in their paint, in its paint method, it would call this style three methods in style. So paint my background, paint my icon, and paint my text. That's <laughs> procedural, that is how it used to work. The other approach here is, is think of this, um, this where you can read compose pix maps. Think of that as the push button itself. It is not gonna paint anything. So its paint method is empty. On the other hand, it will play the role of, the play the parent role for three other things beneath it. Which are these things? These are what we call primitive. These are small objects, small uh, pieces that are able to paint themselves. So the widget does not paint anything, but each of these primitives do actually paint. We have three here. The first one is able to paint that gradient. That, that could be a gradient primitive. So you set a color on it or set stop points on it, and then it paints itself. Then you have an icon primitive. That could be simply an image uh, primitive or, or a small object where you can set uh, the source of a image file and it will paint, render this image file in its size. And finally, a text primitive, which works 
Sim similarly, you set the text and you paste the, the, the text on it. So if we create these three primitives, hook them to an empty, pick, an em empty push button and stack them on top of each other, they will look like exactly as the button was looking for. The difference here is that for any reason, the text changes or for instance, the, the background color change, it does not require the other primitive to redraw themselves. It's easy to do caching of each of primitive individually, either by the, the canvas itself or by the primitives themselves, so that a small change, for instance, in the background will not require the expensive uh, re-handering of text and, and font glyphs or the icon that could be an SVG rendered image or anything else. So if you ch change one thing, we repaint it and then simply compose that with cached pix maps of the other primitives. And that's something that can be accelerated in hardware that's, uh, can, th that can be faster than the procedural painting. So that's the primitive graph idea. Well, if I'm saying to you that widgets are gonna have primitives needed, we need to think who is gonna create such primitives and hook them. We could say that the, the widget itself could do that, but once again, we would not have the flexibility we are seeking. If the widget uh, create a background and a text primitive, then we are constraining the look of a widget to having a background and text primitive. As we wanted the style to be uh, uh, able to change the way um, a widget is composed, we delegated the task of populating, as we say, the widget to the style itself. So styles get empty widgets, and okay, that's a push button, and this style implementation knows that a push button is supposed to have a background and an image to, to match the look of uh, a, nat a native platform, for instance, Mac or, or Migo, et cetera. And so it creates the right primitives to, to fulfill that task. And also the style might create its own primitives that could be specific to a given style to match the particular looks um, of, of the, the platform we are trying to, to match or to achieve what designers have thought of. Uh, I don't know how many of you have worked with a, um, Ramp style implementation, but it's sometimes it is hard to, to match the, the look and feel of the native platform to the hooks that the QRAM style system allows you to, to use. So um, some, some platforms have small peculiarities uh, that not always are, are fulfilled by the, the hooks, um, the, the styles leave to them. So if the style can create whatever primitives he wants, he will be able to make the widget look uh, the way it wants. Okay, but if we have widgets and we have primitives that were created by the, the style, and if the widget does not paint itself and the primitives does the painting, but we need somehow make these primitives talk or, uh, or share data between uh, them and the widget themselves. Using the, the previous example, uh, when I was saying about a style painting a background, we, the style needed to know whether the widget was pressed or not or whether it was um, checked or not. So this kind of information now it needs to flow between the widget who has such states and the primitive or the primitives that are responsible for painting something that depends on, on that information. Um, how, how can this data flow happen? Okay, above we have a label widget that's composed of two primitives, a background primitive and a text primitive <coughs> to take care of its label or the, te the text it has in it. One important thing to remember here is that it was the style who created these two primitives 
to implement the look of the label. That means the label does not know it has a background. It does not know it has uh, a text primitive. So it's not possible for the label itself to just go to the text primitive and, okay, whenever my text change, I'm gonna get my text primitive and set the text on it. Because the, the label itself does not even know it has a text primitive. The style knows that. So one alternative would be the label ask the style, okay, uh, my text changed, please update whichever primitives you think they need, need to be updated. And the style could, okay, find a primitive and set its text to N, for instance. We do not like this idea. We think that there is uh, some kind of indirection here and if we try to look at the, the code to implement the widget set, there's a lot of, um, the code of the, the widget is split among different methods. Some of them are on the widget, some of them are on the style itself. You, um, the update primitive thing, the style uh, usually becomes a huge uh, switch case block. Uh, okay, I'm updating a primitive, now it's a text change, now it's a button. So we don't like this idea, we think that's clumsy. Uh, on the other hand, we like a lot the idea of property binding, which was introduced in Qt Fix, and it's gonna be released in Qt 4.7. The, the whole idea of uh, property binding is that you can, um, okay, connect pre different um, primitives, or, I'm sorry, you can connect different properties in different objects in a way that they will, be, they will always remain connected and consistent uh, regar regardless of any change that might happen on them. So let's say the label widget had a, a title property that, for instance, exposed to public and could be changed by, uh, through its public API. And let's say that the start or the text primitive had a text property. It makes sense in this case as the text, pro as the text uh, primitive is playing the role of drawing the title of the label, it makes sense that its text property is always this, has the, always the same value as the title property of the label. So if we could somehow bind the value of primitive.text that is the text property of the primitive object to the title property of the widget uh, object. And if that binding could always be true, then the, the communication would be solved and in a way that we understand to be easier to understand and more uh, slick looking than the update primitive thing. So with some C++ logic, th this can be implemented, that, that's not a problem. So that's the idea, that's the path we chose to, to follow. Okay, what about event handling? I was saying that we wanted the styles to be able to, to change the way we just behave. So that means the event handling cannot be on the widgets anymore. So in the same way that the painting logic, the, the painting was removed from the widget, event handling should be removed as well. Where should it go to? Well, it should go to event handling primitive. These are primitives than as any others, except for the fact that the, uh, these primitives do not paint themselves, but instead they are able to receive events and handle them in the way they understand it's, uh, they should. So in this example, we have the start button again. It has the old background and label that's responsible for looks. We do, we're not caring about that anymore. But to the right here, we have a mouse error. What's a mouse error? That's a primitive that does not paint, but it, it's able to receive mouse events. Um, it's able to understand, for instance, that the mouse was clicked inside the, the mouse error and released inside it as well or released outside it. And if it's the case, it will emit a clicked signal. And it's also probably uh, customizable, you can tune the way it behaves, or if you are a style developer, you can always create your own style handling primitive in C++ and use it to, to, 
to fit to suit the, the needs you have. Okay, if we say that we have a mouse area that needs click, and we have a button that we expect to emit click signals once in a while, we can always short circuit the signals of the mouse area and the button itself. That can be done by the style when it's populating the widget in the same fashion it could create a binding between the primitives and the widget itself. It also short circuits some signals. That's the idea. Finally, we must respect the public API. I'm, I'm telling you that style, in our view, they could change pretty much everything about the widget. So to which extent, um, to which extent is the widget so, so still respected? So how long is a push button still a push button? Because I can change everything about it. I can remove the click and add a text and etc. Okay, we understand that a push button must have a well-defined public API. That's something that has to be respected at all times. And that's, what, that's the compromise between um, widgets and the applications that use them. So whoever is creating a style must ensure that whenever um, public properties the widgets have, they must be always consistent and they always must be observed. So the solution here is to first of all export the API of such widgets as properties. That's not the case with, with all widgets nowadays. Some, some of the widgets do not expose properties to, of, uh, with the values of their, uh, of, the, of their API, but the idea is to export everything as properties. And once that, that properties exist, we can bind them to the primitives as shown, uh, shown before. So just an example here with a little bit more fancy widget. That's a progress bar widget. Okay, simple progress bar indicator. Um, you can use it to indicate, okay, downloads, starts, or, or whatever you want. Let's say that um, an okay API for it would be to provide two properties. The first one is value, and the second one is max value. So it could say max value could be 100, we say 100%, or maybe 20, as in 20 tasks to be done, or whatever you feel like to, to fill it with. And value, which is the current value, some, something between zero, zero and max value. Okay, let's say that we decided to, to implement it or to style it with two primitives. The first one is a groove, that's simply a frame that will occupy the whole area of the progress bar widget. And secondly, a bar that's a, let's say, a, an image that can be scaled or, or a solid um, shape or something like that, that will have its widget changing uh, as the, the value and max value change themselves on the widget. So how could we bind all these properties together in order to keep this widget consistent? Okay, the groove widget would always be the widget of the progress bar itself. So it's gonna occupy everything, it's a frame, and that's okay. But what about the widget of the bar itself? We, can, we could say that the widget of the bar was the ratio between the current value and the max value the widget itself can have times the widget of the groove. So if we have 50 tasks completed um, uh, in 100, the widget of the bar would be half of the widget of the groove, thus looking like as we expected to. So we can ensure that the behavior of the, and the, the, behavior of the API is consistent with the, the looks of the widgets through property binding. So that's the, our, fi our fifth concept. And together with the, the four concepts I explained before, this wraps up what we understand to be a nice approach for styles nowadays. So for those of you that are um, aware of Qt Quick, most of these concepts might have sound very familiar. And that's no coincidence. We like the idea of Qt Quick. We, we like to use it. We, we have always 
like the idea of the uh, declarative declaring UIs since before Hootsuite. Um, and so it was nat natural that we would bring some of these concepts to the idea of styling regardless of where are we using that. Could be that in C++ or could be included in Hootsuite itself. But let's suppose we have that style, style system working and let's suppose we do have Hootsuite in place as well. How would these thi things interact? Could we use the styling inside Hootsuite or could we use Hootsuite to do the styles? We, uh, okay, just a simple slide about Hootsuite. Okay, Hootsuite is a, a tool or a runtime or a framework to describe interfaces in a declarative way rather than in an interactive way. So rather than creating small pieces of the interface, you write a QML file that's um, easier to understand, that's cleaner, that's probably uh, even possible for a designer who is um, used to, uh, to tools like Flash or uh, other uh, sty styling tools to, to write their own interface with tools. So the idea is to provide a more, um, how can I say, uh, designer-friendly way of creating interfaces. It also allows for faster creation of interfaces, um, also prototyping. It allows you for a retry your interface or fix things without uh, having to recompile and so on. So going back, what's the interaction between this new um, style system and Quick? When we think about using Quick to create our UI, one thing that all sometimes call, uh, comes to our mind is the decision we, we have to make. Should we cr create our custom looking thing with it? Okay, let's say a custom looking button that has uh, images, custom images to, to represent their pressed state or their uh, raised state, or should I use a native looking with it? What's the trade off between these two approaches? We understand that there are situations where we want to use either of these, but, uh, uh, different ones of these. For instance, if we think of a game screen, you probably want to have fancy looking buttons and fancy looking knobs, for instance, to change the weapon if a first person shooter or to select um, a building block in a Sin City like game or whatever. But there are also parts of the application where you configure the application, for instance, uh, where you are not very interested in expending time creating your own widget to, to create a set, uh, settings screen. And besides that, you also want the user to feel comfortable with the visual identity he is always used to in the platform he's using. So let's say you just download a new application, start using it, so you go to the game screen, you saw different widgets, different things. You, you, you dedicate some time uh, trying to understand how it works, new, new buttons, new stuff, it's okay. You download a game, you are supposed to spend some time learning how it works, that's okay. But when you go to settings screen, you do not want to spend time understand which parts of the screen are clickable, which parts of the screen are buttons, which parts are sliders. You want to, to be familiar with you already know, so it's sometimes interesting to have nat native looking widgets, native looking widgets inside cute application, uh, cute interfaces as well, or cute quick interfaces as well. So we see um, space for both approaches here. So we investigated two um, two main ways of integrating styling and Qt Quick. The first way is to have inside Qt Quick widgets that look like nat native widgets and that use the new styling uh, infrastructure behind the scenes. So you are writing your Qt, your Qt Quick file, you are using all the tools Qt Quick provides to create your fancy looking application, 
But when you come up to a certain screen, you just want to say native looking, native looking button. You just write, okay, native, native button, open braces, close braces, you have it there. That's one way to, to use the styling inside Tilt Quick. How could we do that? Simply implement C++ widgets that communicate with this styling system I explained to you and export these C++ widgets to Quick so they could be used there. That's one use case. Primarily for the support part of QML interfaces. So as I was saying before, think of settings screen, think of screens where you want users to feel at home. You do not want them to lose time trying to understand what's a button and you want them to feel at home. That's the, uh, having custom look is not the focus on some applications or in some parts of the, the application. The, the other uh, use case we see is regardless of where are we using our widgets, it doesn't matter if it's in C++ applications like in KDE or if, in, if it is in Qt applications, it doesn't matter. See, uh, let's suppose we have widgets that are na native and they can be used in C++, they, they are used in a lot of applications. That's okay, that's in place. Now let's say designers want to create a brand new style to improve the way the existing widgets look like or they feel like or uh, that's because there is a new KDE release or a new platform we want to support, it doesn't matter. How is the workflow like today? Well, design, today designers think of, think of, of something then they call a developer, C++ developer, to, to implement that. We like to, to short or reduce this gap, and given the fact that the concepts that we exposed before are very similar to QML or Quick, and given the fact that Quick is probably uh, easier to use by designers, maybe we could use Quick itself to do the styling part using the concepts that we explained before. How could we do that? <coughs> okay, our, our solution was to create a subclass of style. Uh, let's call that a cute, uh, cute quick style. And as expected, the style uh, needs to, to do all the, the style tasks we, we have in the, the new approach. So first of all, we have a button widget that upon its creation, gonna ask the style for the style to populate it. For styles create, style is then responsible for creating several primitives and hook them. This very special style, instead of creating text primitives, image primitives, it's gonna create a single special primitive called QML primitive. Hook, get that primitive, load up a QML file inside it and hook it up to the widget using setting its parent. So a single primitive handles all the painting of the, the, the button. And this primitive exports several uh, properties. And the style also binds the, the properties of the, the button widget to the properties of the QML primitive we created. So in the real use case, we could say that to create a style to a push button would be simply to create a push button.qml file. So we go to our designer and say, okay, imagine you're gonna create a button, just create a push button QML file, create primitives as you like, QML primitives as you are used to doing in quick, and, by, and, pro, and probably in this uh, sandbox where you are working, the style could export the button widget to, to the QML context. So the, the, um, the designer would get okay, fire up a text primitive, an image primitive, hook the, te the label of the widget to the text, everything as we said before. But rather than doing this in C++, you could do that inside a QML file and just use this special QML style that would be done only once by us and just load up the right QML file. That, that's the other use case we thought of, integration between Qt Quick and a new style uh, approach. <coughs> so, 
Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, to, to wrap up, what we have here is that the solution we thought of use very few concepts from Quick. That's simply the idea of properties available in object, to objects, and also the idea of property binding. Besides that, most of the concepts are high level. They do not um, require special implementation of Canvas. They do not require special detail of Canvas. And we also think that having high level concepts and less C++ magic and detail allows for those reading this code to better understand it and better use it. This work we are doing, it's still on progress. That, that's a proof of concept. Um, there, there's a repository in Vitorius with that code. Um, it, it does not, the, by, by me being here, it does not mean this is gonna be implemented in Qt upstream. Uh, it might be, but it, but it might not as well. But it also could be implemented in KDE itself. So the, the purpose of this talk is to, to give you an idea, or share ideas, and we are open to, to questions, and that, the idea is there. Uh, we'd like to implement that, we'd like to, um, but also to hear what you have to think. Do, do you think that makes sense, or not at all, or almost there? Let us know. So as I said before, check the Academy technical papers. I'm gonna find more detail about that there, so you can read that in peace back home. Um, reach us in free node at Qt Lab. Um, the code is in Gitorials, that gitorials.org slash Qt uh, components. My blog, there's a little bit about that there as well. And you must have noticed that I always said we, as in uh, myself and those at OpenBossa, those at Qt, every, everybody that in Plasma Devel who has contributed to us in ideas, that's a people, uh, that, that, that's a group effort. That's not my, idea, my ideas, okay? So thank you everybody, hope you've enjoyed. Uh, that's what I had for today. Eduardo, thanks for sharing this interesting ideas. Uh, unfortunately, we have no time left for questions. Make sure you find Eduardo afterwards. You are here around. Okay, yeah. I, I, I'm gonna be here for, for the rest of the, the days until, uh, and also, by the way, but try to like reach me. And uh, I'm, I, actually, I'm willing to talk about you guys about that. That's one of the reasons I'm here today. Good. <laughs>